Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you very much, Ian, for that um, very kind and generous um, introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Edinburgh and in the Royal College of Physicians. Um, before I start, I do want to say a few thank yous. Firstly, to the College of Physicians and the Heritage Centre here, uh, to Ian, Daisy and your colleagues here for the very kind invitation to speak as part of the seminar series, um, as well as your hospitality during my time here. And also I want to thank, uh, in her absence, my wife, Anne-Marie, who was very understanding when I explained that not only would I not be home on Valentine's Day, but I'd be leaving the country. Um, especially given that, um, on a good note, I suppose, uh, it's our first Valentine's Day as parents. So um, at least she has, has some company at home. But um, what I want to do to introduce the paper is just to talk how I came to this topic of humane societies, because um, it's a wonderfully interesting uh, topic. And as I'll explain uh, during the paper, it ties into numerous, numerous avenues of historical research, history of um, um, welfare, history of medicine, history of science, associational culture, history of technology, um, and as Ian outlined, um, my master's and PhD research, which were carried out in UCD and Maynooth University respectively, um, focused on aspects of welfare history and poverty and charity in late 18th, early 19th century Ireland, but always very much looking at the wider British and even transatlantic context. And for my master's research, I looked at a particular fever hospital in Dublin, the Cork Street Fever Hospital, which opened in 1804 and have wonderful records which are now held by the College of Physicians in Dublin. And looking at the Cork Street Fever Hospital, that's one little case study, I became very aware that it was part of a wider fever hospital movement, which spread across Ireland and Britain in the late 18th, early 19th century. And then I went on to do the PhD research on begging and almsgiving in 19th century Ireland, and part of that looked at a network of charities called Mendicity Societies, which were voluntary charities focused on suppressing street begging in the towns and cities where they were founded. And again, um, there were um, dozens, if not scores, of these mendicity societies across Ireland and Britain, all founded in a very small period of time and all very much part of a wider transatlantic movement. Um, and I'll explain uh, what I mean by that uh, throughout the paper. And so as a tangent from that research, I came upon the Humane Societies which have been touched upon by some historians but are aspects of their history which um, do require further um, study. And this paper will examine the foundation of humane societies, locating these organisations firmly within a wider transatlantic context. It will be explored through the identification and analysis of correspondence and the exchange of ideas among members of humane societies in Ireland, Britain, Germany and the United States of America. This paper represents an initial foray into a new field of research, and as such, any comments and suggestions at the end will be most welcome. Humane societies were charities whose focus was on the recovery of apparently drowned persons. As charitable societies, their founders and managing committees were typically urban, middle-class men who gave their time and energy in a voluntary capacity. And the funding of these organisations um, was through voluntary sources of income, so subscriptions, donations, bequests and charity sermons. Humane societies embraced advances in scientific and medical knowledge and pioneered the use of life-saving techniques and equipment, with societies' published reports often carrying illustrations of devices such as life buoys, ice ladders and designs for lifeboats. Humane societies were founded in large numbers throughout Western Europe and North America in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. The first in Amsterdam in 1767, followed by similar initiatives in Milan, Venice, Hamburg and Paris in the following four years. The translation into English of the Amsterdam Society's memoirs in 1771 influenced the foundation of the London Association three years later. 
And by the turn of the 19th century, there were humane societies operating throughout Ireland, Britain, Europe, and North America, constituting just part of an expanding associational world, which some historians have asserted um, as having created the foundations for the emergence of what we now know as civil society. The late 18th and early 19th centuries witnessed the spread of numerous movements throughout the Atlantic world, movements whose members were actively concerned with improving the moral and temporal state of the population, especially the lower classes. This desire to improve and reform strengthened from the 1790s onwards as part of the conservative response to the horrors of revolutionary France and the seemingly uncontrollable potential of what Edmund Burke called the swinish multitude to revolt. Among the movements for social and moral reform, which flourished at this time, were Sunday schools, fever hospitals, mendicity societies, and within Irish and British Methodism, strangers, friend societies. All um, charitable societies run by people operating on a voluntary basis and with a particular target group, um, whether it was street beggars or um, the fever-stricken poor of the slums or in the case of strangers, friend societies, um, kind of unemployed, typically industrious artisans, the, the deserving poor. I assert that each of these collections of societies constituted a transnational movement in that institutions with common objectives were formed under comparable conditions by persons from similar social backgrounds and driven by almost identical social and economic reasons. Furthermore, and crucially, I think, societies within each of these movements corresponded with each other, exchanging ideas, advice, and items of material culture, namely printed annual reports, allowing for the drawing upon of precedent-setting methodologies and the development of a common approach to the society's respective challenges. In seeking to explain the rapid growth of humane societies from the 1770s into the early 19th century, a number of reasons can be identified. So what I'm setting out here is why were these societies founded um, in a relatively short space of time, focused on this problem of people drowning and developing new techniques to resuscitate people who had um, apparently drowned and were pulled out of waters, canals, and uh, seafronts. Firstly, the expansion of inland navigation in the second half of the 18th century throughout the Atlantic world, most notably through the development of canals, led to increased numbers of water accidents and suicides. It's significant that the first humane society was established in Holland, in Amsterdam to be specific, which according to one contemporary source was, and the source is referring to Holland in general, is a territory which has been, as it were, won from the sea by the industry of art. And the cities of which are swarming with people are everywhere intersected by deep canals that may be considered as the roads of the country. The accidents which happen by people of each sex and every age falling into the water are almost innumerable. In a similar vein, the 1793 report of the Dublin Humane Society noted, and I quote, that the increasing number of our canals renders such melancholy accidents as requires this aid still more frequent. Secondly, the expansion of naval forces and maritime trade in the mid to late 18th century meant that more vessels and their crews were actually on the seas. In his introduction to his prize-winning essay on shipwrecks in the 1790s, the University of Edinburgh-educated physician Anthony Fothergill noted that the British Navy comprised an estimated 800 ships, while Britain boasted more commercial vehicles than any other nation. And he wrote, great as it is, however, it can bear no competition with the lives of British seamen on board. Yet between them and a watery grave is hourly interposed only a thin partition of brittle planks. Thirdly, we must consider the impact of the associational culture of the urban middle classes, who desired to be seen to be fulfilling their civil responsibilities in the public performance of charitable works, mainly through an active role in voluntary charitable societies. 
This was especially important to the rising class of medical gentlemen, physicians and surgeons, for whom their involvement with charities, either in an administrative capacity or through the pro bono provision of medical services, exposed them to lucrative prospective private practice patrons and clients, and increased, of course, their social standing within the community. And as the Irish social historian of medicine, Lawrence Geary, has put it, charity was both social lubrication as well as social obligation. The American cultural historian Richard Bell, writing about late 18th century America, has observed a similar pattern. And he wrote, doing good not only felt good, it looked good. The business of benevolence was performative. Participation with humane societies allowed the ostentatious display of humanitarian concern and financial largesse for the purposes of concentrating authority and calibrating status. End quote. Of course, this aspect of philanthropy, the, the self-interest aspect of it, and it's not to say that, that was the only motivating factor for philanthropy, but it certainly was there. Um, that wasn't countenance publicly an awful lot by members of humane societies and their supporters, who presented their endeavours as utterly selfless and disinterested. For example, in a charity sermon in aid of the London Royal Humane Society in the 1790s, the preacher remarked of the society's founders, who are mostly medical gentlemen, and he, he said, the plan of the society is so adverse to any private interested views that it acquits them of all sordid motives. Their sole reward is in the holy joy of doing good, of an institution thus free in its origin from the suspicion of ambitious views and in its plan renouncing self-interest in every shape. Philanthropy must be the only basis. Fourthly, this period witnessed an increasing medical knowledge into the efficient treatment and resuscitation of drowning victims, aided by scientific innovations in life-saving equipment. And these final two reasons, the association of culture of the urban middle classes um, and the increasing medical knowledge, um, account for the prominence of medical gentlemen, physicians and surgeons, um, mainly among the founders and officers of humane societies. Among the key contributors to this vibrant discourse on life-saving and the resuscitation of the apparently drowned, driven by a thriving print culture across the Atlantic world, were Anthony Fothergill, a physician who studied as a medical student in the University of Edinburgh, and who authored an essay on the preservation of shipwrecked mariners, published in London 1799, which is a pioneering work on shipwrecks and methods for saving lives in such situations. Alexander Johnson, a physician trained at King's College Aberdeen, who was largely responsible for promoting the work of the pioneering Amsterdam Society in England. And Charles Kite, a surgeon, who was a member of the Company of Surgeons in London and who published an essay on the recovery of the apparently dead in 1788. As well as those medical gentlemen who were contributing to this vibrant discourse, um, inventors and scientists were also partic participating. Among them were Henry Greathead, who authored the report of the evidence and other proceedings in Parliament respecting the invention of the lifeboat, 1804, Lionel Lucan, the invention, principles of construction and uses of unemergeable boats, 1806, and the inventor George William Manby, who pioneered the use of an apparatus for establishing communication between uh, a ship that had um, hit the rocks offshore and the shoreline in the case of shipwreck and his innovation led to the saving of hundreds of lives during his own lifetime. In a nutshell, Manby's invention was something like a cannon that was set on um, coastlines that were notorious for shipwrecks. And in the case of a shipwreck happening not too far off offshore, this cannon would uh, launch a kind of a hook or an anchor, hopefully attach itself to the boat, establishing a line of communication, literally a rope, between the boat and the shoreline, hopefully allowing the sailors to um, make their way uh, to shore. And Manby's innovations around shipwrecks and lifeboats were the subject of two separate parliamentary inquiries in 1810 and 1823. And it, finally, in trying to explain why these humane societies um, grew up in 
a limited space of time and in a, um, a wider context of the transatlantic humane society movement, the significance of the fashionable enlightenment notions of sensibility and sympathy and a renewed emphasis on the moral obligation uh, to one's fellow citizens drove the foundations of these societies. And th the whole issue of sensibility is a very 18th century concept, and by that what's meant is, um, I suppose, the emotional sensitivity to be aware of other people's needs and to um, express one's sympathy for those needs. And of course that leads on to um, actions in terms of um, sympathizing with people, and out of this, it's believed, I suppose, by some historians, they argue, came these humane societies. And I'll, I'll come uh, to that later in the paper. Acts of benevolence carried out in the name of the public good were increasingly held not just to be spiritually purifying, but also practically enjoyable, while they also marked out the virtuous man from his vulgar, self-interested counterpart. And according to Richard Bell, the American historian, these life-saving activities reminded ordinary citizens of the ties of mutual obligation and aid. And so I want to come to the Royal Humane Society in London, because uh, it serves as the parent body. It sets the precedent for all other societies in not just Ireland and Britain, but on the eastern coast of the United States. Founded in 1774 as the Society for the Recovery of Persons Apparently Drowned, changing its name to the Humane Society and later with royal patronage, the Royal Humane Society, the London organisation publicised skills in rescue techniques, especially in accidents with water, though in other sorts of apparent sudden death too. The society supplied equipment, awarded prizes, published pamphlets, advocating mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, tobacco clusters, electric stimulation and the importance of rubbing and keeping warm. Within a matter of decades, the Royal Humane Society's methods were being practiced by life-saving organizations throughout the Atlantic world, as well as by medical practitioners and laypeople. They were promoted, um, <clears throat> excuse me, not only by members of the Humane Societies themselves, but also in medical directories and handbooks. For instance, here we have on the left-hand side the title page of Butler's Medicine Chest Directory, published for Charles Butler, MD, of Sackville Street in Dublin. And this includes a section on the appropriate treatment for cases of suspended animation, drawing on the methods of the Royal Humane Society. And to summarise briefly the methods promoted so actively by the Royal Humane Society for cases of the apparently drowned, and these were widely adopted by sister societies um, uh, across Britain and the wider world, we can summarise them as follows. The removal of wet clothes as soon as possible. This is in an instance where someone has gone into the water and they're dragged out by their uh, would-be rescuer. The removal of wet clothes as soon as possible and convey the victim to a nearby house to be laid before a moderately warm open fire. The introduction of cool, refreshing air through an open window or door. Air to be artificially introduced into the lungs through the insertion of a bellows into one nostril and the closing of the other nostril and the mouth, the rubbing of salts and alcohol onto various parts of the body, and finally, and if necessary, the application of tobacco smoke by means of a clister into the rectum. And this, uh, the top picture is a contemporary bellows that would have been inserted into the nose, and underneath is a contemporary French cartoon of the um, use of the tobacco clister. Um, among the practices that people were strictly advised not to undertake in cases of drowning, um, to revive an apparently drowned person, were hanging the body by the heels, swinging it, and rolling it on a cask, as, and I quote, all such improper treatment are extremely improper and may prevent the proper means of recovery from succeeding afterwards. And I have two little notices from the Bath Humane Society report in 1818 and the Dublin Society from two decades before. Um, what is in a very early part of the report, when they're setting out their methodologies, again drawing on the techniques of the London Society, they're saying, please do not do this. Uh, you'll only make uh, things worse. Part of the work of humane societies were publicising their endeavours and achievements 
and crucially their innovative methods for resuscitating drowned persons. In 1808, the first number of the short-lived but influential Belfast Monthly Magazine carried a notice pertaining to the Lisburn Humane Society, which included, and I quote, general directions to be observed in the recovery of persons drowned or affected by extreme cold, noxious vapours or intoxication, end quote. And these mirrored the methods of the London Society, namely the application of moderate heat, the rubbing of the body, and the application of artificial fumigation. Societies distributed printed instructions as well as boxes of equipment to danger spots, so-called black spots, known for their high incidence of accidents or suicide attempts. These boxes typically contained basic medical instruments, blankets, and alcoholic spirits. Authorities in Amsterdam, Venice, and Mainz were known to provide and distribute such animation boxes, while in 1787, the Paris Society which had saved 600 out of 700 people retrieved from the water since its inception 13 years previously. They printed, and I quote, proper instructions and distributed 10,000 copies of them throughout the kingdom, together with a proper box containing the necessary instruments for recovering the drowned, end quote. Upon the establishment of the Lisburn Society in County Antrim in 1808, its founders, who were the medical men of the town, acquired resuscitation apparatus from the London Royal Humane Society, as well as copies of the London Institution's annual reports and other published works on the topic of suspended respiration. We can try to gauge the extent of these humane societies. Um, I haven't yet gone about drawing up a com comprehensive list of the numbers of them, but the historian Amanda Monitz, an American historian, has established that throughout the Anglophone world, nine societies, nine humane societies, had been established by 1783. So in the 16 years or so after the Amsterdam Society um, was established. In the following two decades, between 1783 and about 1805, 32 societies were founded or uh, re-established after um, Withering Our Way. And around 1807 and again in 1815, there were again spurts of the foundation of these humane societies throughout the transatlantic world. I wish to present for the next few minutes a brief case study of the Irish manifestation of the humane society movement. To date, I've identified six humane societies, but that's not to say there weren't more. Um, the first one was in County Cork uh, on the southern coast, 1787. The following year, the Dublin Society was founded. In 1793, the Limerick Society, followed by those in Lisburn, Derry and Newry. Five of these locations being significant port towns and cities. And in the case of Lisburn, it was an inland town but centred on the River Lagan. And as such, the Irish Humane Societies followed the wider pattern in being founded in places with local access to substantial bodies of water. That these Irish organisations all date from the same period, that is the two decades between 1787 and 1808, reflects the strengthening philanthropic impulse that um, existed in late 18th and early 19th century Ireland and Britain, as well as mirroring philanthropic trends among the urban middle classes throughout the Atlantic world. Regrettably, no organisational papers appear to exist for any of these Irish entities. No collections of minute books, no runs of annual reports, accounts, case books or registers. Instead, what little information we have must be pieced together from scattered sources, such as newspapers, occasional published reports, for example, this um, surviving report for the Dublin Society in 1793. And you can see there the title page of the um, report on the left hand side the account of the Dublin General Dispensary and Humane Society established at the Dispensary Court in Temple Bar for the purpose of administering medical and surgical assistance to the sick poor of the city and of recovering persons apparently drowned uh, sorry, apparently dead from drowning, suffocation or other accidents of the Irish societies most information is available for the Cork Society um, it appears that it was the most active of all the Irish institutions. There's many instances of the Cork Society corresponding with its counterpart in London. And these 
instances of correspondence can be viewed in the substantial records of the London Royal Humane Society, which are held in the London Metropolitan Archives. Furthermore, nearly all of the Irish cases of drowning that were reported to the London Society to keep them up to date with what's happening uh, across the British Isles in terms of um, um, uh, resuscitation techniques came from Cork, suggesting that the Cork Society was particularly active in corresponding with the London parent body. Wherever humane societies were established, medical men were invariably among the founders. And this was no different among the Irish organisations. The physicians and surgeons of the Dublin General Dispensary were to the forefront of the city's humane society. Undertaken to treat any case of apparent death by drowning or other accident at the dispensary's premises in Temple Bar. And Temple Bar, for anyone who knows Dublin City, is significantly located a stone's throw from the keys of the River Liffey. Again, the proximity to a substantial body of water. Similarly, the Lisburn Humane Society, established in 1808, was founded by the medical men and a number of other active persons in that town and neighbourhood. It was common for dispensaries to be attached to humane societies. We see this in Dublin, we see this in Lisburn, and we see this in Edinburgh and uh, Leith. Um, where the Edinburgh and Leith Humane Society was instituted in 1784, to which a separate dispensary was added in 1816 before both institutions were merged in 1825. Appointments to medical charities, positions that typically carried no salary, enhanced professional reputations and advanced career and social prospects for these medical gentlemen. And in terms of the historiography, Lawrence Geary and his book, Medicine and Charity in Ireland, is the best Irish examination of this, while Peter Clark's book on um, British clubs and societies is the um, most valuable British counterpart. And to illustrate the prominence of medical men, men with these societies, the Dublin Report of 1793 carries the names and addresses of 14 physicians and surgeons and one apothecary who publicly associated themselves with the Humane Society and offered their services um, free of charge in cases of apparent drowning. The Bath Report from 1818 carries the details of 33 so-called medical assistants, which was mainly physicians, surgeons and apothecaries. <clears throat> and again, highlighting the lack of sources really for the Irish Humane Societies, we have little advertisements for charity sermons in contemporary newspapers, but what we have are little snippets like this. And these are two um, notices advertising charity sermons in aid of the Dublin Humane Society from the 1790s. That's the kind of level of detail we get for the Irish manifestation of the movement. As with their British, European and North American counterparts, Irish Humane Societies awarded prizes to individuals who saved others from death by drowning or some other type of accident. In August 1808, the Limerick Society made um, what they call the usual awards to four men, and I quote, for having exerted themselves in saving from drowning three children in different parts of the river near Limerick. And we see it there on the uh, top newspaper piece, and it's cropped from a PDF document, so it's a bit blurry, but I'll read it out in case you can't see it. On Tuesday last, at a meeting of the Humane Society of Limerick, the usual rewards were given to John McEnry, John Culhan, Dennis Madigan and Michael Barrett for having exerted themselves in saving from drowning the following persons um, in different parts of the river near Limerick, vis-à-vis -vis Mary Fitzgerald, aged 12 years, on the 4th instant, Francis Fanning, aged 11, on the 24th, and Sarah Quinn, aged 12 years, on the 26th. What's crucial about this is the people who rescued the children are being named publicly and they're being rewarded publicly. And that's part of the um, endeavours of the humane societies. That this work for one's fellow man is um, being publicised in the thriving print culture of the time. In 1821, the Dublin Society paid out £40 in rewards to persons who have exerted themselves in rescuing individuals from drowning. Medals and financial awards also crossed the Irish Sea, as the London parent body encouraged life-saving feats throughout the United Kingdom. 
For instance, in 1831, the Royal Humane Society transmitted £10 and a gold medal to the crew of a Galway fishing boat who rescued the crew of a merchant vessel which had been stranded off the Galway coast in a strong gale. Later in the same decade, a Coast Guard, Mr Owen Jones of County Wicklow, was awarded an honorary silver medal for, and I quote, your courage and humanity in saving the crew of the Nouveau Destin on the coast of Wicklow during a heavy gale. And in January 1840, a Mr Smith was also awarded the Society's honorary silver medal for, and I quote, your noble courage and humanity in plunging into the River Shannon and saving the life of S. Bindon Scott Esquire on the night of 11th of August. As well as highlighting and rewarding instances of courage in life-saving endeavours, the Humane Society movement also promoted new research into life-saving techniques. And in 1822, the Royal Humane Society advertised a prize gold medal, patronised by King George IV, and I quote, for the best essay of discovery on the prevention of shipwreck and the preservation of shipwrecked mariners. And the prize was funded through, funded through the bequest of Dr. Anthony Fothergill, the Edinburgh educated physician we met earlier on. An interesting feature of the work of humane societies, unlike most voluntarily funded charities in this period, was that the beneficiaries transcended all barriers social class, sex, religion, age. Most charities focused on clearly defined groups. Uh, they had their target uh, kind of clientele, if I can use that word, orphans, widows, the widows of clergymen, unemployed artisans, street beggars. Um, yet, as historian Amanda Monitz has observed, anyone might drown. So all humanity was the object of the Humane Society movement's concern. End quote. This important fact was asserted in the founding rules of the Cork Institution, which, like other Irish humane societies, associated itself with a dispensary. Um, and the report stated, in the first instance, that of the dispensary, we provide for the poor alone. And by including the latter, i.e. the humane society, we know not how soon our humanity may revert on ourselves. End quote. The universal reach of these societies' net of benevolence was identified and highlighted by the charities as a unique selling point, ever important in the crowded marketplace of voluntary charities in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. For instance, in a charity sermon in aid of the Royal Humane Society in 1807, the London preacher Reverend Richard Yeats spoke of the organisation as an institution which, quote, provides assistance when every other charity is useless. All other charities alleviate the sorrows of life. The Royal Humane Society saves life itself, restores the vital powers which, accident, sorry, which accidental misfortune had suspended and which, without its timely aid, must have been lost forever. End quote. The Royal Humane Society in London served as the parent body within the Irish and British manifestation of this transnational humane society movement. For instance, Dr. Joshua Dixon, who was the leading figure behind the establishment of the Whitehaven Humane Society in the um, northwest of England, observed of the London institution, your humane society, from which originates every similar institution, may be justly deemed their parent, or rather as the centre of exalted philosophy, whose rays with a genial energy are directed to a boundless circumstance. Europe has long gratefully attested its um, benignant exertions, and America, uh, and etc., experienced its beneficent and revivifying influence. The Royal Humane Society grew into one of the most successful and influential charitable societies in modern British history, and its influence can be identified through the succession of published letters from individuals throughout the English-speaking world describing instances of successful revivals of apparently drowned persons using the means adopted by the London Society. The Royal Humane Society attracted members from the elites of British society. Um, not surprising given it was founded by uh, medical gentlemen. For instance, the founder of Methodism, Reverend John Wesley, was a perpetual governor while an honorary membership was bestowed on the surgeon Edward Jenner in 1803 
to mark his pioneering work on the smallpox vaccination and have taken there the certificate of honorary membership to Jenner and have cropped a little bit on the right hand side <clears throat> and in case you can't read it it says the president and directors of the Royal Humane Society of London instituted for recovering persons from suspended animation have this 14th day of September 1803 elected Edward Jenner the discoverer of vaccination an honorary member of the said Royal Humane Society Many of the key figures in this vibrant transnational discourse on resuscitation and um, um, innovative techniques around the recovery of the apparently drowned corresponded with their counterparts in other countries. For instance, the Amsterdam Society's methods for resuscitation were cited in the influential medical guide Domestic Medicine first published by the Edinburgh-educated physician William Buchan, probably mispronouncing that, in 1769, and republished in more than 140 separate editions, proven particularly popular in the United States. Members of humane societies typified the transnational nature of this middle-class associational culture and the emphasis on improvement of this period. And the key figure within this movement in terms of the dissemination of information throughout Britain, Europe and the transatlantic world was Dr John Coakley Letson, a founding member of the Royal Humane Society. Letson was a Quaker physician who by the age of 40 years was operating perhaps the most lucrative private medical practice in London, as befitting a man of his education, social position and professional ambitions. Letson was involved in numerous philanthropic initiatives and corresponded with like-minded individuals throughout Britain, Europe and North America, regularly enclosing copies of the Royal Humane Society's annual reports with letters to his friends and correspondents. For example, in the 1780s, Letson was thanked by the Cork Dispensary and Humane Society for advice proffered to the infant charity and was described by the Southern Irish City's institution as, and I quote, our corresponding physician in London. And he was also enrolled as an honorary member. Letson's exchange of these reports was not limited to like-minded colleagues in Ireland and Britain. In June 1797, a Dr. Struve of Gorlitz in Saxony wrote to the English doctor requesting the latest reports as well as copies of English language medical works. And he wrote, I beg the favour of your sending me not only the second volume of the transactions of the Royal Humane Society, but, if it is possible, some of the newest English medical books, in order that I may translate them into German to communicate in this way to my countrymen the literary treasures of Great Britain. In the same decade, Letzum informed one correspondent, several humane societies were established in America, the West and East Indies, with which we correspond. Among the regular correspondence of both Letzum and his uh, physician friend, Joshua Dixon of Whitehaven, was the physician, philanthropist, and member of the Philadelphia Humane Society, Benjamin Rush considered to be one of the founding fathers of the United States of America, further highlighting the transnational and transatlantic exchange of information and printed media, in this case uh, published reports, among medical gentlemen concerned with the rescue of apparently drowned persons, further demonstrating the importance of transatlantic networks between medical men at this time, especially those actively engaged with voluntary associations such as humane societies. In 1792, Letzum, along with Anthony Fothergill, was elected a foreign member of the American Philosophical Society. And Fothergill later actually ceased his medical practice in Bath and moved to Philadelphia, becoming an active member of the Philosophical Society. The proliferation of humane societies represented a movement in that institutions with common objectives were formed under comparable conditions by persons from similar social backgrounds. They fit in with Professor Robert Morris's description of voluntary societies as, and I quote, networks of people in similar situations, solving like problems and fulfilling like needs in an independent manner, but conscious of each other's existence, end quote. And developing, 
Robert Morris's point, we see that these societies were not founded in an intellectual vacuum, but in an environment where information regarding the work of like-minded charities and like-minded individuals was increasingly accessible and frequently exchanged. The founding literature of these charities, such as published annual reports and statements, typically made reference to earlier humane societies and the influence derived from these predecessors. And as the historian Richard Bell has observed writing of humane societies in the United States, and I quote, corresponding secretaries communicated constantly with sister societies throughout the Atlantic world, exchanging information that helped managers refine, perfect, and promote their life-saving techniques, end quote. News of the work of existing organizations drove others into action. For example, in the late 1780s, the Dublin newspaper Saunders Newsletter, in an article highlighting the work of physicians in Liverpool in rescuing apparently drowned persons using the means recommended by the London Society, lamented the absence in Dublin of a similar institution. And the newspaper article editorialised, and I'm reading from the bit where the star is, as accidents of the same nature frequently occur in this city, i.e. in Dublin, it were much to be wished that an association was formed on the benevolent plan of the several institutions of the kind in England. There are many persons of surgical skill and humanity who interest themselves on those occasions when they happen here. But the stimulus required to produce other immediate exertions in such cases is wanting and we could wish was supplied by subscriptions of the affluent. In coming over here this morning, um, I purposely got an early flight from Dublin because I wanted to go to the Edinburgh City Archives because I knew from their online catalogue that they have there a manuscript minute book of the Leith Humane Society for the period 1822 to 25. So I pre-booked it in advance and arrived there this morning and they presented me with a minute book. And if anyone is familiar with these records, it's a typical 19th century minute book 100, 200 pages long, and I was looking forward to getting my teeth into this document, and I flicked through it, and every page bar seven pages were completely blank. So it was, it's a rather short little source for the, the Leith um, Humane Society, but I did find this um, little um, piece in the minute books, sorry, in the minutes, and you can see there it's from the 9th of July, 1822, and we read, Mr. Goldstream, who is one of the members of the Leith Humane Society, laid before the meeting remarks made by his son, Mr. John, when in London, upon the receiving house and apparatus of the Royal Humane Society of London in Hyde Park, which were read to the meeting. The meeting, this is the Leith meeting now, were highly gratified for the communication and requested Mr. Goldstream to convey to his son their thanks, therefore, and they directed these remarks to be put up with the other papers connected with the Humane Society. So here we have the Leith Humane Society meeting and saying, and one of the members says, my son was in London and he attended a meeting of the Royal Humane Society and he made some contribution to that meeting. We don't know what it was, because we've no record, but uh, it's recorded in the minute books of this meeting, um, which was attended by four men, a rather small enterprise here at the, the local um, institution in Leith. To conclude and to wrap up and to bring a few things kind of together, an interesting aspect of the work of humane societies was the universal nature of their endeavours, not only in the rescuing of all persons apparently drowned, um, and again, as I mentioned, it's unusual because charities at the time always had their target group, but in their goal to educate people of all classes in the most innovative techniques in resuscitation. These methods were not to be the preserve of medical gentlemen, although the involvement of these practitioners was essential for the efficient running of the institutions. And an early commentator on the work of the pioneering Amsterdam Society praised that institution's, and I quote, its principal object being to instruct those who happen to be present when persons supposed to be drowned are taken out of the water in the best means that can be used for their recovery and to excite them to make the attempt. End quote. In its early existence, the Amsterdam Society reported that 150 persons had been saved within a four-year period. And I quote, 
many of whom owed their preservation to peasants and people of no medical knowledge. End quote. This theme of a universal duty to be able and willing to assist one's fellow man was embraced by the physician Alexander Johnson, who was largely responsible for introducing the methods of the Amsterdam Society into England. And writing in his 1784 work, Relief from Accidental Death, Johnson asserted, <clears throat> Those, therefore, who neglect or decline giving such aid, again, in instances where someone is taken from the water, will not only be considered deficient in an essential point of humanity, but in some measure as accessory to the patient's death by allowing the last spark of his life to extinguish a reproach which no man can, upon the least in reflection, allow to be laid to his charge, even under the prejudice that none but medical men can administer relief in such critical situations, as it is a sad apology for the loss of a life that the medical assistant came too late. What he's saying there, it's no longer acceptable for someone to say the doctor came too late. It's up to every individual, regardless of social class, of education, um, to be equipped with the knowledge um, and ability um, to um, rescue someone from drowning or to help in that endeavour. This paper has provided a brief outline of the emergence of humane societies in the late 18th century, locating their establishment within a wider European and transatlantic context of the expanding realms of corporate philanthropy and associational culture as well as the increased medical um, exploration of resuscitation techniques, especially in relation to victims of apparent drowning. We saw that in the little case study of Ireland, the Irish Humane Societies corresponded with English counterparts, sharing ideas and advice on organisation structure, appropriate medical interventions in cases of drowning and other accidents, and technological innovations in life-saving equipment as well as developing a system of rewarding acts of bravery. Humane societies were part of an international and even transnational movement which was fostered by an exchange of both intellectual ideas and items of printed culture, an area which I wish to further explore. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.